Welcome to the history of England from 410 AD to just before the Norman invasion of 1066. Episode 11 on Anglo-Saxon kingship. At this point it's worth noting the nature of kingship. We know in some parts of the continent there was an elective process. However, what exact form it took is not always clear. Different realms having different processes. There seems somewhere along the lines a similar selection and some kind of consent from other nobles or men of birth in parts of England. But it wasn't any secret vote or show of hands, it was probably where a certain person stood in the pecking order as to how much weight his views had. The people who could be king seems to have been limited to certain lines of lineage and descent and it is noticeable that over in the Frankish court the throne was held by a Merovingian while the person in power was Charles Martel, merely titled Mayor of the Palace, and his son, Pepin the Short, had to apply to the Pope to ascend the throne. Whether he ascended using a ladder with him being short is not recorded. Election is the word being used, but it is more agreement that one person should be monarch. Often there was only one person to choose from, it was that some vested interests and political figures wanted their man in place. They were more acclaimed king than elected. Just like the European Union presidents today. At least back in the early medieval period they appear to have been more honest. In England there had certainly been a number of occasions where a brother had taken the throne instead of the eldest son or even a second brother. But how this was decided at the time is not known. When we think elective, we think of people having a vote from a wide number of electorate. But this can be dismissed and the pool of people may be two or at most three to choose from. The history of kings in Germanic regions appears to stem from local villages, deciding who was to lead their community. Sometimes the strong man just forced himself into the position but more often it was by consent or acclamation. Also, the person may have married into his position or be once removed in the bloodline. Ethelbald was the grandson of a brother of Penda, and in 672 in Wessex, there is one known case of a Queen Seixburg taking the throne. It only appears to have lasted a year, and we don't know how it ended. But it illustrates both that queens were possible and it makes clear that the line didn't automatically pass directly to the next male heir. There is a suspicion that once Christianity had taken hold there may have been an anointing ceremony because the first references to them in the 8th century in Fur it had previously been done. It has the clear benefit of giving sacred legality to the king. And anyone who overthrew him would have to be certain they could get the recognition to be anointed. After all, it was no good lopping off a rival's head to become king if the other nobles promptly turned to the local bishop and appoint Pepin the Portly. It would be uh, highly embarrassing to say the least. The king at this time was also the ring giver and this ring gave authority to another nobleman to have certain rights and privileges. It also gave authority to be judge in minor cases of arbitration. So the king had ultimate power through the ring and was able to dispense that power. And if any are thinking they had similarities with Tolkien and Lord of the Rings, correct. The professor of Anglo-Saxon was again using Nordic tradition for the idea of one ring to rule them all. Also, once a king had been monarch for some time, it is he as sitting tenant who largely decides his successor. Offer going to the extent of having his son, Egfrith, crowned before the old king had pegged it. Similar happens on the continent. Conrad I of Germany designates Henry of Saxony as his heir while still on the throne. There is also the matter of tax and from whom it is collected and at this stage we know little. 
there was usually an offering made to the king once a year. This seems to have been done on a circuit basis. So the king would turn up at the Wittnagamot's meeting point, let's say the Skyrack, or Shire Oak, a famous one was still standing in the late 1920s at Headingley in Leeds. And there is both an original oak pub, Skyrack pub opposite where it stood, plus the War Memorial and St Michael's Church. The local lords would be there to pay tribute in the form of money, cattle or precious items like an inlaid sword or jewels. However, we don't know how any previous agreement on payment was reached or how it was calculated. There were a number of items used for tribute in place of the usual tax. Some may have been substituted to preserve the noble's own breeding pigs, cattle or whatever. In which case perhaps a trained hunting bird like a falcon or perhaps an embroidery as a hanging for a wall which may at first seem like a poor item, but would be seen as taking time and thought so costly, and thus improving relations with the king. And in those drafty halls, anything that kept the warmth in and the wind out was welcome. Slaves at this time were also given as they were still used by the Anglo-Saxons, and these would be people who had been captured in battle or conquest. We know that kings each had a treasury. In Alfred's case, it was spread out, but it is thought the central treasury was probably held at Winchester, but that a treasure chest was carried around with Alfred's entourage. This would be large and probably secured with more than one lock on key. The majority of taxes were paid in goods, and these would be used to feed the entourage and various officials created to serve the king's government. The most valuable commodity was land, of which the king usually, but not always, had the largest portion. Then oxen and horses, or other domestic farm animals. It would appear part of the job of the king was to set the rents to be paid. In his laws, Inni, king of Wessex, they were written around 688 to 694, sets out what they should be. As for food, rent from 10 hides, 10 vats of honey, 300 loaves, 12 ambers of Welsh ale, 30 ambers of clear ale, 2 full grown cows or 10 weathers, 10 geese, 20 hens, 10 cheese, an amber full of butter, 5 salmon, 20 pounds of fodder and 100 eels. No mention of a partridge in a pear tree. This immediately raises the question, was an amber a set measure that could be tested against something? It suggests a barrel, but was there a king's barrel against which you could measure the size of one's own barrel, as would be set out in 1215 and Magna Carta? A single set of weights and measures is usually demanded by people who want a fair dealing. Unfortunately, we don't know. There is no suggestion of such, but it is hard to see how anything could be agreed if it wasn't so. In his letter to King Offa, Charlemagne asks that the Mercian traders ensure the cloaks are of the correct measure, which suggested that the Mercians were giving themselves a bad name by trying to shortchange their counterparts in the Frankish kingdom, although the wording infers that the cloth should be of the Frankish measure. No mention is made of a standard to measure against. There is also mention of black stones, which are thought to probably be grindstones for making wheat. The suggestion in the letter being that Offer sends a delegation to Charlemagne to ensure the correct size are ordered and made. These are two monarchs, Offer and Charlemagne, going to some trouble to establish regularity between them for ease of trade. But it would be centuries before an Englishman Bishop John Wilkins in the 17th century would come up with the bright idea of having a standard metric system. In the early years after the Romans left, it is significant that the people claiming to be king had the correct genealogy, which always meant being able to prove your ancestry went back to the heathen god Warden or alternatively Thor. Another point is how much power they wielded. This could be down to the individual. 
A strong king-like offer could, after time, rule with more or less absolute power. But weaker or newer kings may well have been more like elected presidents and ruled only while it suited others. Forget democracy, though. The electorate was probably limited to at most a dozen nobles. The majority of kings were probably somewhere between constitutional, absolute and elective, as well as having the correct hereditary ancestry. Adding to the mix that some kings appear to have been nominated or designated by the previous monarch, keep in mind that although they didn't have widespread literacy, that oral history was able to recount how the Romans derived their emperors. Most were designated by adoption by the incumbent emperor. That the Anglo-Saxons on rare occasion also used this method should come as no surprise. The clergy were mainly educated from Rome even when Irish Christianity was to the fore. Before the mid 8th century, probably no anointing. I mention this because the further forwards in time one comes, the more important the actual anointing is as to whether you are a monarch or not. A point often forgotten by some historians when claiming that some minor historical figure was or should have been monarch. Since the 10th century, if you weren't anointed, you weren't monarch. If you found this greatly, please click the like button. I publish a new video every Monday with occasional bonus episodes. Also, please comment and spread the word on your favourite social media outlets. Likewise, hit that bell to get the latest episodes. Thank you.